Okay. Um, I was I was thinking I was I was really struck by how um, Mark the uh, mapping teams thing that you are launching right now today could be immediately useful to several of the other presenters, um, particularly the geography teachers. So I was wondering if you could speak maybe a little bit about how you know those two projects might work together. Um, so I've been talking to uh, Teach OSM. I think that that would be an immediate first thing that we could do uh, during the OSM uh, US, uh, well, the OSM 15 year uh, birthday, we had uh, a, s a small conversation about how can we build better tools for the OSM US um, uh, members. And we were thinking about we should have teams at least um, uh, as part of maybe the OSM US website or Maybe Teach OSM should have a team per classroom. I think that that could be something that we could uh, we could work on. The Teach OSM website could maybe uh, integrate with the API that we're building, and then every classroom could register a team, and then they, it shows up on the Teach OSM website. We have other ideas for how to make the Teach OSM website and sandbox a bit more powerful. Maybe they're not mapping features per, per se, but if we can start by, um, let's say, registering OSM IDs of each classroom and maybe topics they want to work on, that could be something that we start with. Um, Mike and Michelle, uh, so I don't know if you've talked with Steven Johnson, who's uh, yeah. So I think he's organizing a birds of a feather uh, at some point. If he hasn't yet, then let's talk about um, organizing one around education issues. And then I'm also working with a professor at George Washington University who's uh, working with Stephen on both OSM teaching materials as well as QGIS and other open source mapping and um, more conceptual mapping uh, topics as well. So let's make sure to connect and anybody else who wants to. Maybe a birds of a feather tomorrow? I'm sure you guys can probably hear me, I'm a teacher, so. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that's something that would be perfect because our kids, um, just like how you were saying, like, if they, they're, they, need, they need things that they are passionate about, that they want to do, that they're able to actually map and, and that they can see. And getting that into the classroom, there's just been a bit of a, um, I don't, it, it, I'm sure logistically it's a problem, um, but I, like I know when uh, ArcGIS came to our school to even train the teachers, we couldn't click on the links for the maps because they were blocked by our servers. So it's like, it seems to be there's always some sort of block of something, but cohesively we want to work as, as much as we can with you guys. Um, so that would be that would be absolutely Good perfect work, to go and talk there. That would be wonderful. We would appreciate it. A uh, question for Madison. Um, as maps are very visual, um, was it more challenging, I guess, to grow in the technical aspect of geography and cartography or the visual aspect or another area? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it was more challenging uh, to understand the conceptual first. Um, I think I have a very expansive knowledge of the conceptual part, um, and I learned much more like the intricacies of the visualizations in the latter half, but I feel like that was easier to learn only because I had such a strong um, foundation of conceptual. Um, question for Christopher. Um, it, so in some of those images, you had things like fire hydrants and stuff like that that were sort of like a little bit distance away from where the picture was located. Um, in terms of mapping stuff like that, how are you pinpointing where that fire hydrant is actually on the map? So the entire process uh, it requires multiple photos. We do 3D scene reconstruction. Uh, this uses mostly what's congruent with a library called Open Structure from Motion. So you can find that on GitHub. It's a Python library that helps you reconstruct that scene. Uh, and then we're classifying in each image which part of it is a fire hydrant. So once you have those pixels classified, 
Uh, in that 3D reconstruction, the pixels kind of, uh, to put it one way, it starts to look like Legos building that 3D scene. Uh, but we're finding where they're common between the images. So we have that in kind of a, an XYZ world in a 3D model, and we reconvert that back to longitude and latitude. And so try to predict where that should be on a normal map in this projection. Uh, so there's a bit more about it if you check out uh, vimeo.com slash mapillary. You can see some videos that kind of show the process a little more. Uh, but mostly it's just using computer vision uh, in general. Hi, um, I'm not actually sure what this question is, so we might like kind of reveal it as I'm speaking, but it's from Madison, because I, I was, I was uh, kind of really intrigued that you introduced yourself as a, you know, a nervous cartographer and, and struck by, like, um, I, I'm a nervous, you know, like, choose your noun afterwards, but you know, like there's a, there's definitely nerves in like the creation um, and in, in this industry. Um, and, and I appreciate that it's important, I think for all of us to um, uh, recognize and empathize that with all of our, you know, kind of nerves in this room, um, but there's also a space for confidence. Like, you know, you should, you should, and I'm sure you are, like proud of the final like slide that you that you showed us, um, proud of your journey and confident in that journey, um, and clearly have uh, the space to to teach others as well. And so I'm wondering something about like you know if we're all we don't all want to be creating and teaching maps from a, a place of this nervousness. We also want to be. Um, from a place of, of knowledge and, and grounding. And I, maybe you could speak a little bit to how you um, balance the two or your own movement towards like just being, you know, in this nervous space towards being able to produce such like, you know, confident, good work. So, cause um, yeah. And I'm, I know this isn't about no, fire no, hydrants okay. specifically, Don't you know, but, which are important, but okay. yeah, some, something in that realm, if, if you could pick it apart, what the question was. Yeah. Um, I try my best. Um, I think that students uh, have a little bit, uh, I have a bit of an upper hand with students just because I am more familiar with uh, either I've written the material or I am more comfortable with uh, whatever software that we're using. Um, so I, I feel okay there. Um, specifically, uh, when I was first teaching them how to use Leaflet and Mapbox GLGS, I laid out a very kind of specific uh, environment that they would um, start to code in. Uh, I think because I knew that environment through and through, um, it was easier for me to kind of like communicate with them in a more confident manner. Um, as far as being nervous constantly, um, I think it's okay. And I think that, um, as you were saying, like that humility is a good thing to have, especially when it comes uh, to mapping, because there is, it's impossible to know every single thing that goes on in a map and how other people will perceive it. Um, so if that, does that help answer? We, we can talk later. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Uh, hi, this one's from Madison as well. Uh, my name's Fletcher. I work at Cardo. Um, and uh, I, your talk resonated with me a lot. Uh, I went to uh, CU's geography department, but this was uh, about 10 years ago, and, and that's maybe 50 years in tech terms, sadly, <laughs> even though I'm only 30. <laughs> Um, but uh, my question for you, uh, and I guess it somewhat extends to the rest of the panel um, in, in regards to teaching is, uh, you know, I, I often onboard people on our client side uh, who are very bright and come from a client-based background. Um, but I come from a geospatial background. I'm in kind of this like rare outlier who actually likes talking to clients and also building maps. 
<laughs> uh, and I have to train them um, in geospatial. And there's just so many avenues uh, that, could, that could act as the initial entry point for that. And I, I often struggle with how do I take someone who comes from, say, like a business development background, working with local governments, and, and inform them as to like, what we do here in, in uh, the geospatial world. Uh, and, and so my, my question is, what technology do you typically start students on who have zero geospatial experience uh, w when you're trying to approach a, prog a problem with them programmatically for what might be their first first exposure to, to coding? Because I, I often have no idea where to really start. <laughs> so this is a bit analog, but I like to start off essentially with like a pen and paper or other set of crafting. I know that's not software um, specific, but I think kind of going back to the first confession and the proposal for that confession is to start off in that very analog manner to make sure that that understanding is grounded first. Um, but as far as like introductory software, um, I believe I was started off with QGIS and maybe Esri, ArcGIS, and ArcGIS Online. Um, I feel as though I'm very biased and I have to say Mapbox also. Um, it is a very easy platform to use um, as well. And it was uh, just because it does have like the design and the developer ability, you can integrate it um, all in one. Um, so I think it also depends very largely on like the business use case that they have. Um, there are definitely times when like um, uh, you want to use a different projection, so like Mapbox won't be the best, but then there are other times when you'll want vector tiles, so a Mapbox will be the best. So it will depend case by case. We can also discuss this at length later. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you should go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll take this one, I guess. Go ahead. Um, as far as, like, I guess, what students... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, ArcGIS, I know we, that's one of the first ones that our kids have been introduced to. Um, S3, they've, they've done the yeah. stories, they've been taught how to do the story scrolling, but that's yeah. really, and they do coding, but STEM, yeah. I mean, what do you? Well, I mean, as far as the coding goes, I'm now just starting to understand vaguely um, what my STEM kids do, other than fix my computer when it's not working. <laughs> um, but as far as that goes, OSM has been kind of, the main program that at least I'm familiar with that's kind of bridged the gap in terms of that. And it's one of those where now the best part is I never have to be the, never, I've never been the smartest person in the room with those kids, but now there's something that connects, you know, their tech talents to the social studies talents. And that kind of leads to collaboration between both sides of the room. schools like they're so there's the there's the software part of it like there's that and then there's us who we're, we're teaching with the geography portion of it and it's I believe it's probably contracted also on the basis of the the counties and who yeah and we're also we're also definitely I mean because we teach in different states but we're also handicapped in a way because you know you can only use programs that are contracted through the schools in some cases, and then there are parameters on the Wi-Fi on sites they can't access and can access, and certain terms, you know, so it ends up being one of those logistical issues where type in the website, it won't allow you to go to website for said reason, and then long talk with IT at the school, and it's, yeah, the district blocked that, so how do we unblock it? Uh, we don't. <laughs> okay, so looks like I got to change my lesson. So, yeah, or or um, actually, ironically, um, one of the middle school students that couldn't access to confirm his email, and they all suck at being bad, goes to me and goes, so I can get to my email, but I think I might get in trouble. <laughs> to which I told him, I was like, save the stuff you're going to get in trouble for for something like more valuable than like, what were you doing? I was trying to access a mapping program. So that ends up being part of the issue, at least from the high school level, is that there are some computer logistical, you know, hurdles that we sometimes can't climb over or put in front of us. Yeah, accessibility, that's, that's a big issue, is accessibility and user-friendly for the kids. Like, I mean, and most of them are, but it's and I think it's accessibility is a big issue.
I have a question then for Jennings. Um, so you showed the kind of geo footprint of these this corporate editing and the like edit counts. Um, and you went a little bit into the types of things they were doing, but I think I had to go through that. So I was curious just to hear more about whether uh, the corporations are mapping different things than what volunteers are mapping, not just geographically, but like the amenities and things like that. Yeah. Um, I guess it shouldn't be a huge surprise, just a major focus on roads uh, from most of the corporations um, and turn restrictions as well. Counting turn restrictions gets really fun and complicated. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of a lot of turn restrictions and, and roads. Um, but also, as you saw in there, there's a lot of buildings. I'm trying to think if it breaks down per company. Um, Uber does a lot of buildings, um, which, is, which was kind of fun to see. I was just, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, and I guess that's kind of the next step uh, in that work is to really dig into the like the full history and the actual edits and the interactions between the edits and see if there is uh, distinct kind of signatures that pop out um, to see like what those edits are, what type of like validation, see if we can like compare that to some quality stuff. Um, so it's kind of the, the next steps. This maybe is for Jennings also. Um, I'm interested in what the non-corporate people are doing. And when I go to, um, to see what's been happening, you know, with wh who did it kind of mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. it's obliterated by the corporate people that are mapping driveways up to houses and things like that. Hmm. Is there some way that we could filter, just put in minus corporate, when we do, go into that filter, get all those 100 or two or 300 people out of the picture so I can see the real mappers that live there and what they're mapping? Um, I, on, a, on a technical level, uh, yeah, I guess that's definitely could be something that could be put in something to look at that. Um, I think this gets into like a larger question of like ways to, uh, I think this kind of also like turns to teams of like ways to classify types of editing that's happening, um, and ways that we could, if you want to, if you want to look at the activity, um, I mean, that's what makes, I mean, Okay, OSM's well, a map, that's cool, but like what makes it really interesting is it's a map made by all these different groups of people. Um, and so if you want to get into like filtering by certain by certain groups, uh, that's something where like teams could 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 be really valuable. Um, we're at like a fun point in time, I think, where it's a big, messy data set working with it's difficult, but also in the last couple of years, like a number of amazing tools have come out to do that. And so I think we're just kind of scraping the surface of how we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, Maybe I answered your question a little bit, but yeah, I think there's ways we can we can do it. The other thing is just like tracking the corporate teams is also that's something. And well, any team um, kind of tracking any team in OSM like hashtags are one way to do it, um, but everyone needs to use the hashtag right, and so we don't necessarily see that. So um, different ways to kind of track activity is the first the first barrier to that. So um, for that, thank you, Mark. Um, hi, I, I miss your talk, so you might have like totally covered this already. I apologize. Um, hallway track. Um, how messy is OpenStreetMap in comparison to like, I don't know, are there any comparable data sets? Um, like on a scale of one to 10. And um, do you have any um, learnings about why the road networks are um, so the the map is so so driven by the road networks. I mean, what does that uh, I don't know tell you? Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess for what it is, uh, I mean, OSM is actually kind of amazing and fits uh, and I guess it's kind of the opposite of messy uh, at the scale that it operates at. I guess I say messy in terms of just like a lot of data and you got to make the connections between the nodes and the ways and you got to look at when you start to look at the history is where things get uh complicated um and so that's yeah that's a whole nother talk um that's sort of kind of what i mean by messy is like reconstructing exactly how the map is 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 made it's just a kind of a messy process um and yeah so um roads um it's there's been an observed pattern that like roads fill in first and then come like buildings and amenities and such. Um, that's, yeah, I think roads are 
I mean, I, I'm not probably the right person to speak to that, but road, the road network might be like the first immediately like actionable, valuable um, uh, piece of the, the map, um, routing and such. Like that's a great purpose of maps, but there's so many. Um, yeah, that's kind of a cop out, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't entirely, uh, I'm not entirely sure. It is one thing that I think is interesting. Exactly, that would be like, that's like, I was, I was gonna say that, that felt too. Uh, um, yeah, I think what is interesting is that like the street network, like this has been observed as the street network does fill in first. And so it's like, you can almost use that as a proxy of like, if buildings are being added to an area, that might mean that the street network is somewhat complete because people have kind of shifted their focus. Um, so there's been some quality work like driving from that, which is kind of, which is kind of interesting and fun. Yeah. One, one thing just to add to that, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier and it's about also skill sets or, you know, your capabilities in terms of mapping. So if I need to add a house to a map and I'm faced with that blank empty space in Northern Canada, I'm a bit hesitant, you know, is my house really there or is that amenity really there? Once the roads show up, now I feel, oh yeah, that's my road. I know where I am. I can now add more features there. So, you know, it, Putting that road network in then gives you the capability of adding, getting more people to do mapping because now they feel confident about adding things that they can see that are related to them. And so you see that as well, you know, the roads went there, then the buildings went in, then more stuff, you know, because now people can see how that thing that they wanted to add now relates to the other things that are already there. And with that, I will say thank you for being a lovely audience. Um, thank our speakers again.